Greetings and peace. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown with yet another episode of Interfaith Issues where we discuss the issues of common interest to the monotheistic religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. For the last few episodes, we have been discussing the doctrinal differences that divide Christianity and Islam and discussing how to rectify those differences and in some cases discussing how those issues are actually issues upon which the scriptures of the religions agree. In this episode, I'm going to begin by discussing the concept of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to begin by offering the observation that almost nobody in the Christian world can explain what they are talking about when you say Holy Spirit. When you ask them what is the Holy Spirit, what are they talking about, what are they referring to, almost nobody can give a concrete explanation which, for lack of a better word, makes sense. In the Islamic religion, the Holy Spirit is a concrete entity. It is Jibreel, or in English, Gabriel, the, the angel of revelation. In the Christian faith, we struggle to make sense of what the Holy Spirit is. It is described at times as the spirit that God sends down upon the righteous to whatever. But to get a concrete explanation, that is lacking. Now, the fact of the matter is that this, this phrase, Holy Spirit, is translated from the Greek pneuma. Pneuma is a word that can mean a great deal more and also a great deal less than Holy Spirit. If we look at Kittel and Friedrich's Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, this tells us that pneuma can mean wind, it can mean breath, life, soul, spirit in a transferred sense, spirit in a mantic sense pertaining to prophecy. It can be the spirit that stirs and inspires. It can be the divine spirit. Um, the problem is that, quote, but there is in Greek no sense of a personal Holy Spirit. What are they saying? They're saying that despite all of these possibilities in translation, there is in Greek no sense of a personal Holy Spirit. And yet that is how most Christians understand it. Most Christians understand the Holy Spirit as being something very personal. Why? Because they are told that they have it. Who tells them this? Is it God who tells them? that they have the Holy Spirit? No, because what are they? Are they a prophet? Of course not. It is a human being who tells them. It is a priest or a pastor who tells them, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. Well, how does he know? Most of the time, if we ask the priest or the pastor or the minister to simply explain even what the Holy Spirit is, we get the same evasive answer, which is, inconclusive and unsatisfying and yet they believe that they have the power to tell other people who has the Holy Spirit and who doesn't. Now an example of how the Bible suffers from translation is that one very critical word as a matter of fact the word that basically determines how Christians view the concept of the Holy Spirit is the Greek word paraclete. Parakletos in Greek, some say paraclete. Basically, it is the word that is translated five times in the New Testament, four times in John, once in the epistle of John. And it is translated at times helper, comforter, advocate, 
mediator, consoler, defender, and Holy Spirit. But there is a key to this word. If you have heard me discuss this before, you know what I'm going to say. And it is this. We find this word only five times in the New Testament. As I said, all of them are in the alleged writings of John. Four in the Gospel, one in the first epistle. If we read the first epistle of John 2.1, what we find is that Jesus is identified as an advocate. Advocate being the translation of the word paraclete. So whatever a paraclete is, Jesus was one. We know that from the first epistle of John. If we look a little deeper and we go to John 14.16, in 1416, we encounter a passage which foretells the coming of another paraclete in which Jesus Christ informs us that at the conclusion of his mission, following the conclusion of his mission, another paraclete would come, and it is described as allos parakletos. Now, in Greek, there are two words for another. One is allos, one is heteros. Heteros describes another where there are two. Allos is another where there are many. And the word used in this context is allos, another paraclete. Again, whatever a paraclete is, Jesus Christ is identified as having been one. And here he is foretelling that after his mission, another paraclete would come. Does it not make sense that he is talking about another of whatever he is, another prophet. So we encounter here a word that is commonly mistranslated as Holy Spirit, but in fact a word that refers to the third and final prophet as predicted by the Old Testament. The first two, of course, being John the Baptist and Jesus Christ, three minus two equals one, and it is no surprise to find Jesus Christ speaking of Allos Paracletos, another Paraclete, another of whatever Jesus Christ was, and Jesus Christ was, of course, a prophet. Now, the final mention of the Paraclete in John is to be found in 167. And this is a very key passage. Quote, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. If I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Very, very, very critical passage. Why? Because it makes it clear that the Holy Spirit, or whatever paraclete is, was not pre-existent. In other words, Jesus is saying, if I go away, I will send him to you. Before that, he says, if I do not go away, the helper will not come. So can paraclete, translated here as helper, can paraclete really be the Holy Spirit? No, it can't anymore. Because Holy Spirit is described too many times during the time, during the mission of Jesus Christ. It is alluded to, it is referenced, it is described as being existent during the mission of Jesus Christ. But here Jesus is saying, if I do not go away, the paraclete, whatever that is, will not come to you. So obviously it cannot be the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit was preexistent. This is just one example, again, to add to the many examples that we have discussed before of how the Bible suffers in translation. It is also an example of why we have to be very careful in considering the Holy Spirit as being an ethereal, inexplicable entity. Let's move on to another concept, the Lamb of God. This is a quote from John 1.29. The 
The problem is that although John the Baptist is recorded as having identified Jesus Christ as, quote, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, later on we find in Matthew 11:3, John the Baptist is having second thoughts. And he questions, quote, are you the coming one or do we look for another? Now, in one case, it is recorded that John the Baptist is certain of who Jesus Christ is, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Later on in Matthew 11:3, he's no longer sure. And he's questioning him. He's having second thoughts. Are you the coming one? Are you really? Or do we look for another? Which one is it? What does the New Catholic Encyclopedia say about this? That the Aramaic word, talia, can be translated to boy or servant, as well as lamb. Furthermore, the proposal that the phrase uttered by John the Baptist was, behold the servant of God, and not behold the Lamb of God, in the words of the New Catholic Encyclopedia, is, quote, very plausible and, quote, much easier to explain. Let's stay with that thought for a minute. We're going to take a break. Please stay with me. We'll be back shortly. Mokhtar Maghrabi. From darkness to light, from ignorance to knowledge, from vice to virtue, from aimlessness to direction. Find your heart. Find your freedom. Watch. Heart Talk. Heart Talk. Today at 5 p.m. Saudi Arabia and 6 p.m. UAE on Peace TV. Pearls of Prophet Muhammad. Peace be upon him. Abu Huraira. May Allah be pleased with him. Narrated that the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, he who believes in Allah and the last day should either utter good words or better to keep silence. And he who believes in Allah and the last day should treat his neighbor with kindness. And he who believes in Allah and the last day shows hospitality to his guest. Sahih Muslim, Volume 1, Book of Faith. Chapter 20, Hadith number 75. Mutahir Abdullah Sabri. Let us not become so attracted with this material world that we forget about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Instructions to humanity from the Creator. This material world is nothing compared to what Allah has promised us in the hereafter as a reward for our good deed. Do you know? Islam says, it says Islamic guidelines next on Peace TV. Welcome back. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown continuing with this episode of Interfaith Issues. We have been discussing the concept of Jesus Christ being the Lamb of God. We are now moving on to a discussion of the concept of atonement. We have to ask ourselves, who authored the atonement? It is such a beautiful concept. We want to believe it. We would love to believe it. The idea that somebody else paid for our sins, that through believing in this person's redeeming sacrifice, we will achieve paradise. Um, so we have to really ask ourselves, who authored this concept? If it was from God, we would be foolish not to accept it. It would be the greatest offer, the greatest bargain that can be made in life. If it was not from God, we have to be very careful. Because if it was not from God, and we base our expectation for salvation upon the concept of the atonement, when we get to the hereafter, we're going to be in big trouble. So, where did the concept come from? We have to assume that it did not come from Jesus Christ. Why? Well, 
If it came from Jesus Christ, it is hard to believe that he would not have told his followers, listen, just don't worry about anything. In a few days, I'm going to give the atoning sacrifice. You're going to be cleared of all responsibility. And you can just go through your lives, take your place in paradise at the end, just because you believed in me. We do not find that anywhere in the Bible. I know a lot of people want to believe it. I know a lot of people love the concept of responsibility being removed from them and having somebody else atone for their sins. But how does that possibly make sense? We have discussed before the concept of original sin and the simple fact that the, the concept of original sin does not seem plausible. It's not supported by the scripture, and most certainly it is not something that Jesus Christ himself taught. In fact, it is clear that he taught the opposite, that he taught direct accountability to God and that sins cannot be inherited. So if there is no original sin, how can we make sense of the concept of atonement? Where did the concept even come from? if it did not come from Jesus Christ? Well, if you answer Paul, you would be correct. We read in Acts 17, 18, then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, Paul, and some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. Now Paul directly claimed to have conceived the doctrine of resurrection as follows, quote, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, 2 Timothy 2, 8. In fact, we find this concept of Jesus dying for the sins of mankind nowhere in the Bible, except in the epistles of Paul, Romans 5, 8 through 11, and 6, 8 through 9. Nowhere else. Not in the Gospels. Nowhere else. So, again, we're drawn back to remember that when we compare and contrast the teachings of Jesus Christ with those of Paul, Paul contradicted virtually everything Jesus Christ ever said or did or was. Jesus being a Jew, he lived by Old Testament law. Among his recorded teachings are, quote, but if you want to enter into life, meaning the life of the hereafter, keep the commandments, Matthew 19, 17. Another quote, quote, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill for assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Matthew 5, 17 through 18. You know, that is such a strong passage. I would like to read it again, but break it down. Do not think I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. In other words... The law does not pass. After Jesus Christ, what did Paul say? The law is canceled. On whose authority did he speak? Was Paul a prophet? Did revelation come to Paul? No and no. He was not a prophet. He did not receive revelation. But what he did do is cancel the revelation that Jesus Christ received. Assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, have heaven and earth passed away? As of now, at least, they haven't. So, whatever Jesus Christ was saying, it is still in effect. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle, what are a jot and a tittle? A jot is the Greek iota. It's the ninth letter of the Greek alphabet and the smallest one. So, in other words, not even the smallest 
not even the smallest letter of the law. A tittle is a little diacritical mark. It's like a, a stroke or a dot. It is the smallest, the smallest diacritical mark that you can make in the Greek language. So even that, even that, what will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Now, I was talking with a Christian once, and he said, well, yeah, all is fulfilled. I mean, Jesus Christ, he completed his ministry, so all is fulfilled. I said, you know, that's an interesting way of looking at things, but I have one question for you. Will there be an antichrist? And he said, well, of course. Okay, and will Jesus Christ come to defeat that antichrist? Well, sure. And will the, he then establish the, the religion of truth following that? Absolutely. I said, so all is not fulfilled. So here we have clearly Jesus Christ stating that the law will not pass. And yet, Paul is telling us that all we have to do is believe in the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ and that is sufficient for salvation. Paul's amendment to the teachings of Moses and Jesus, in other words, the cancellation of Old Testament law conveyed by Moses and taught by Jesus is as follows, quote, and by him, Jesus Christ, everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Acts 13.39. Well, People like to hear that. They like to hear that they are released from the law. So let's have some more of that. Quote, but now we have been delivered from the law. Oh, doesn't that sound sweet? But now we have been delivered from the law. The law is no longer there. Okay, Jesus Christ might have taught it. He might have said that it will not pass as long as the heavens and earth are in place, as long as all is not fulfilled. But here comes along somebody with a a sweeter message, not necessarily a true message, but gosh, it sounds good. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died, meaning suffered, having suffered to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter, Romans 7, 6. Wow, that sounds sweet. Forget the law. Just have the spirit. Just believe. Again, Paul's teaching, not Jesus's. James taught that faith alone was not sufficient to salvation. It is one of the reasons why James and Paul were at odds with one another. If you read James, you find a chapter that has the heading, Faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. Faith is not sufficient. Quote, you believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. James 2.19. A more modern way of saying that might be, you believe in God, so what? Even Satan believes and fears him. What's the difference between you and him? The difference between the righteous and the unrighteous is not only in their belief. It is in their deeds. A righteous man might believe in God. Satan also believes in God. But the righteous man performs the works to support his belief, to testify to his righteousness. James again, quote, a man is justified by faith. No, that's not what he said. A man is justified by works and not by faith only. That's what he said. James 2, 24. Why? Because, quote, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Having said all this, one thing is for sure. Jesus Christ will return. And on that day, he will establish the religion of truth to all mankind. And those in transgression will be disavowed. And those upon the religion of truth will be welcomed into the true faith. This is something that Christians and Muslims agree upon. What they disagree upon is what the religion of truth is. That concludes this episode of Interfaith Issues. Once again, I am Dr. Lawrence Brown. 
Thank you for attending this issue. We hope to see you again. For now, peace. I feel the peace, I feel the peace inside, of me. inside of me, a complete tranquility. I remember Allah, He remembers me. Feel the peace, feel the breeze, fresh, pure, holy peace. Peace in you, peace in you.